Yes, ladies and gents. Welcome to United People's TV. Welcome to a lovely interview. I think it's going to be a good interview here with Karen Tejwani. Karen has been writing. He's written this book. He's just released only a, what, a couple of weeks ago, The Glorious Reinvention, The Rebirth of Ajax Amsterdam. And it's a book all about the last 10 or so, 10 to 12 years, roughly or so, of the history of Ajax and how they've sort of rebuilt their club. Hmm, It's almost like that's exactly what Manchester United are hoping to do under Eric Ten Hag. So I want to speak to Karen today to get a bit of insight into, into the sort of legacy that Ten Hag is leaving behind. What were the what was the relationship like between him and the fans and him and the owners? You know, what are the characteristics that he can bring to us? Speaking about uh, his use of the youth team and, and how that's been fundamental to the sort of rebirth that's happened. But Karen, thank you very much for joining me today. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right, Sam. How are you doing? It's, it's uh, good to... I'm doing great, mate. And I tell you what, I can't wait to talk to you about this because obviously you've uh, you've been following Ajax for some time now and you've watched firsthand. The, the, the sort of the work that Ten Hag has been doing behind the scenes. And I, I think the first thing that I want to speak about, the first question I want to ask you about is Ten Hag has obviously got a fantastic legacy for what he's done with Ajax. And uh, in your book, you mentioned how it was, it was, it was Cruyff who came back in and told Ajax that they had to sort of refine their roots as a football club. And ultimately, it's Ten Hag who's been able to take them really up a level over in the last few years. You know, what is what will Ten Hag's legacy be? be like when he leaves Ajax now I understand that it might change depending on what happens in the last few games of this season because that title is necessary and it will be a shame for his last season to end with a, with a potential domestic double that ended resulted in, in a lost cup final and losing the title but what is the legacy that Ten Hag will leave behind how, how will Ajax fans actually be remembering him well, I think it's going to be a good legacy regardless of what happens in the next couple of weeks it'll be a sour ending if they don't win the league but it will still be a very good legacy to leave behind because, and I say this quite often, that he is the, be the best Ajax coach since Louis van Gaal. And Louis van Gaal was there in the, in, the, in the 90s. So they haven't had a coach as good as him uh, over a period of time. Uh, so that, that's a really big enough legacy to leave behind because even if he leaves now, he will be leaving with two league titles, two Dutch Cups, and most importantly, uh, and most popularly as well, a Champions League semi-final, uh, which hasn't been done by a Dutch club in about two decades. So um, it is a big legacy to leave behind regardless. And it's not just on the pitch itself that he was successful off the pitch as well. You know, when you think of the players he brought through, uh, the players he gave, sort of gave him careers, uh, people like Matthijs de Ligt, Tony van der Beek, uh, Frankie de Jong was an academy player, but he eventually found his way uh, at Ajax under Ten Hag. And even in the new team, uh, Ryan Gravenberg, Julian Timber, even Anthony. So there's a couple of players who can attribute a lot of his success to him. And as I mentioned before, the, the trophies that he's won and and he was sort of the final piece of the jigsaw for the Ajax puzzle. Um, so uh, in terms of legacy, there's no doubt that he will leave as Ajax's best coach of the 21st century and the best coach since Lee Van Hull, regardless of whether Ajax win the league or not. And I think they will eventually win, win the league. They could win it as, or could come close to winning it as early as this weekend. Um, yeah. So they are, they are quite close. And, and I think that it's something that, that's very positive to leave behind. I, I think, well, fingers crossed. Is it a... Uh... Is it A's? Is it Altmar that Ajax plays weekend and PSV yep. got fire? Is it fine all the way? It's fine all, yep. Yeah, so that's so both teams playing. So I think they're all inside the top six. Those games, so it'll be tough, yep. tough games for both. But um, I think the thing I find most interesting about about this book, about about the title of it, and it's the rebirth of Ajax Amsterdam. Now, that's why there's a lot of parallels in terms of what's happened to Ajax over the last few years, and what Manchester United fans are hoping Eric Ten Hag can bring to Manchester United because let's be honest we're at a club that we need a rebuild what well, geez rebuild we've been saying year after year after year but it feels like maybe this time it's a little bit different with the right manager and somebody's got a true identity but what what attributes do you do you think or do you know sorry that Eric Ten Hag has that he'll bring with him that will sort of help Manchester United rediscover who they are as a club because he's somebody who really has an identity he's somebody who really has a structure and a system. And you can't really say that about any United manager post Fergie. What are those characteristics and those attributes that Ten Hag will bring that could really help us actually genuinely rebuild as a club? Well, firstly, I think it's not just his job on its own. So um, a football manager, regardless of how good he is, can't do the job on himself because he needs uh, a good support system and a good footballing system around him. So a lot of it will be determined by how much support he gets from a footballing standpoint. But let's assume he gets that. I think that he will bring uh, first uniformity to the club and uniformity to the team where 
the team sort of feels united towards one cause, which is what his Ajax teams have always been. Uh, they've always been a, a united group, um, which hasn't always been the case with United, especially this season where they felt disjointed. There's always been little clicks you heard in, in the media. You felt there's been uh, disagreements in the squad, which I'm sure there have been a few because the way they think, it's, it's, it's quite evident that they're not together. So I think that's the first thing he brings. It's a, it's a level of teamwork and a level of unity in the team, which is quite important. Uh, second, he brings a high level of tactical acumen, which I think several United managers in the past or in the last decade or so have lacked. Um, so there's a there's a good style of play, a traditional Ajax style that you assume when you when you think of Ajax, you know, playing with domination on the ball, playing with assertiveness and trying to move the ball forward and, you know, not just passing for the sake of it, like we saw quite often under Louis van Gaal. Um, so there's that. And, and there's a, a goal towards promoting his own players and promoting especially younger players uh, through through the team. We've seen an Ajax where players like Julian Timber, Ryan Gravenberg have come, come through in recent years, even before, as I mentioned, Matthijs de Ligt was there, who was good, but became even better under Ecton Hagen. There's a level of responsibility given to him. So he wants to see players around him and younger players, especially improving. So I think those are the three main things uh, that he can do within his own control. Now, you talk about what he has inside his own control. The one thing he definitely can't control is the owners. Uh, and that's a huge thing at Manchester United. Obviously, you know about the Glazers, you know about the, the fan protests that are going on now and have been going on since before they took over the club. What has... Uh, Eric Ten Hag's relationship been like with Ajax's owners? Because one thing that's always said about him is said, yeah, but Ten Hag was successful at Ajax, but then he had Mark Overmars, Edwin van der Sar, and he had, as you say, the right support network around him. Um, what are the owners? Who are the owners of Ajax, first of all? Uh, and what was the relationship that Eric Ten Hag had with him or Eric Ten Hag, Overmars and van der Sar? Did everybody work together? Was there any sort of clashes that ever happened? Well, there are no owners per se at Ajax. There's the president and there's a supervisory board. And then there's the football group, which is, as we know, Edwin van der Zaal, well, especially only Mark Overmars because Edwin van der Zaal is now the CEO. Um, so um, the main person he worked with at all times was Mark Overmars until he was until he left the club in February. And um, it was a very good relationship with Overmars because they knew each other in the past as well. So Overmars and um, Ten Hag worked together at Go Ahead Eagles, which was at the time a second division club uh, back in 2012. And they earned promotion to the Eredivisie, which is the first division uh, in 2013. So they had a good relationship from there. And after Overmarge moved to Ajax, uh, after a couple of years, he brought in Eric Ten Hag because, firstly, he knew him well. And secondly, uh, Ten Hag, even in 2017, was considered as the crown prince of Dutch coaching, where he was seen as, you know, the future great Dutch coach, which is which has been quite rare to say because Dutch coaching has lacked in quality uh, for most of the 21st century. So Ten Hag was seen as this bright new prospect uh, at the time. And he's proven that at Ajax as well. And the main thing about Ajax is that there is a good level of communication between them two, between Overmarge and Ten Hag. Uh, and that was not just in what they did on the pitch, but offered as well. So working on transfers and working in uh, in rigor as to which academy players to promote or which uh, how the academy should be uh, should be working. So there was always a good report between them. And I think that you know when Overmarge left in February, which he had to leave because of the allegations and, and yeah. the stories against him, uh, he had to go. And once that happened, I felt that was Ten Hag's time as well because they were so close. I always felt that Ten Hag would live. Uh, stay until the end of his contract next season. But once Overmarge left, I thought that was the end of Ten Hag's time as well. Um, and that was a common belief around, around Ajax and Netherlands. So, uh, as I said, there was a good relationship between them and a very positive one. And that's what's needed at United as well to make it work. I mean, obviously, I think in our current structure, if we're looking at who our Overmars is going to be, that's going to be John Murto, who's come, who's currently our football director, learning on the job, uh, has done quite a good job, I would say, in a lot of decisions he's been making. But whether he can have that sort of relationship with uh, Ten Hag remains to be seen. And uh, obviously, there's still talk about Paul Mitchell maybe coming in as an actual sort of uh, transfer guru, if you want to call it that. But there's lots that still has to happen at Manchester United. Now, uh, one thing that, that you said about Ten, Eric Ten Hag is obviously his tactical acumen. But for me, he strikes me as a man who really builds relationships, both with the fans, but also the players, as you say, with Overmars. It, that's going to... He's a very meticulous individual. You know, the, the, the biggest problem that Manchester United have, you, you said it at the start of your video, it's all about that uniformity. We haven't had that uniformity in a long time. Everybody's done what they wanted. Players have done what they wanted. There's too much player power at the club. How do you think Ten Hag will go about changing like the mentality of the players to buy into his ideas on and off the pitch? And, and are there any sort of examples you can draw upon from Ajax where maybe he's struggled, not that he struggled to do it, but Examples you say, like, here's, here's the perfect example of that work, working of him getting his mentality and his ideas across to the players. 
Well, it, it's it's he's, it, it, there's always been a case that Ajax. Right? Ajax are traditionally a club of uh, egos, and they're 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 the biggest club in the Netherlands. So there's always a, a level of pressure around them. I think that he's handled it quite well. So that's I think that's important to point out because this Ajax was seen as Ten Hag's first big job, uh, and he handled it quite well. So I think there's always been that. Uh, uh, evidence that he's able to handle it, which I think he will be able to do at United as well. Uh, so that's always been there. And I think that it's going to be quite challenging for him at, at United itself because not only does he have to come in and implement his own ideas first, he has to clean up the mess left before him. So that's going to be quite a challenge as well. And there's a, a, a huge number of players in that squad that he has to either get rid of or manage quite well. You can name people like uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, or even Bruno Fernandes, David Hare, whoever. It's going to be a, a tough job for him. But if, I imagine he if, would. If, be... I, if I can ask, sorry to interrupt you, Karen, but if I can ask, what was the um, what was it like at Ajax before Ten Hag came in? What sort of what was the mentality of the squad that he came into that he changed into what it is now? How, how different is it now compared to it was before Ten Hag came into Ajax? Uh, it's, it's, it's glad you asked that because when I mean, he joined at Ajax in 2017, uh, that was the same year they reached the Euro League final against United and they lost it. Uh, so until that point, there was a good uh, feeling in the squad. But after that, Peter Bosch left after a disagreement with Ajax. So the head coach left and and uh, the new person came in, uh, Marcel Kaiser. And under him, there was a period where they were struggling. So they were out of European competition altogether. They lost the Champions League qualifier, lost Europa League qualifiers. And they were out of European competition for the first time since 66. Um, so that was about 50 odd years. And then uh, there was obviously a, a sour feeling around the club because of the tragedy with Abdullah Nuri, who was the youth player who got a heart attack on the field yeah. and um, he had to end his career. So there was a, a bad mood around the club overall because of those two factors. So at the time he joined, there was, I wouldn't say a, a bad feeling. It was just a, a feeling of melancholy around the club because they were all you know, in a bad mood and, and it, was, it wasn't the best season. So when he joined, his first job was to pick them up and he wasn't able to do that because... Uh, they lost the league title and they lost. They, they, didn't win, they finished trophy last season and they were almost on the verge of missing European football or the Champions League again. Uh, but he got them there eventually. Um, so that was uh, the issue and he sort of picked them up from there. So there is evidence of him being able to pick up a, a broken squad or, or picking up those broken pieces and sort of making it work. And the season after that, which was his first full season, was the season where they uh, reached the Champions League and the Champions League semi-final. So he was able to sort of build that squad with his own hands and, and sort of I mean, that's, that's an incredibly quick turnaround, really, to go from it that is. to his first full season, getting in the first uh, Champions League Was it since uh, the 90s with Van Gaal? Was that the first, the yeah. last time you were there? Yeah, that's since 1996. That, that's very, very impressive. But um, something that uh, you, you, we're still in the dark about as far as uh, his coaching staff. Now, Mitchell van der Gag is obviously his um, assistant manager at Ajax. And, and I know there's goalkeeping stuff. How important have Ten Hag's coaches been to Ten Hag? You know, how important have they been in sort of influencing his uh, his system and everything and how involved are they i suppose is the question i want to ask is mitchell van der gag the sort of assistant manager that would just kind of just sit there and not really do much or is he someone who's really quite vocal really quite active and really quite a big part of the whole ten hag system well it's always seen as it's similar to the football group above ten hag as well but they're always in communication you know we've seen in the past especially with united where the head coach and i've heard this quite often the head coach whether it's Mourinho or social whoever it is uh, sort of takes a step back in training and lets the assistant do the job. Um, but it's not the case, it's, it's not been the case with Ajax with Ten Hag, but, but because it's the both of them, whether it's Van der Graag, whether it's Bograder uh, or Ten Hag, just taking up control and they all assist each other in trying to make the team better. So it's always been a united effort, similar to the football group above Ten Hag, where they're always in communication and trying to uh, work for the betterment of the team. So I think that's always, that's going to be carried forward regardless of uh, where they go at United. Um, so uh, he always wants a group uh, that knows the club quite well, which is why I always have a feeling that he'll bring back Steve McLaren or at least Robin Van Persie to sort of be there in the squad and, and uh, help him understand the club even further. And I think that Steve McLaren would be a good addition to the club as well. I know, I know you didn't ask this, but I should mention anyway, I think Steve McLaren would be a good addition because of yeah. uh, his working relationship with Ten Hag in the past. They worked together at FC20. Uh, in that case, McLaren was the head coach and Ten Hag was the assistant. So it would be a bit of a role reversal uh, if they are to join United. So I think he would be uh, the best option because Ten Hag always prefers having someone who slightly has a bit of knowledge about the club and McLaren obviously has a lot of knowledge about United so it, it would be a perfect choice for him. Uh, I think uh, a lot of United fans are uh, looking at McLaren and are a bit scared because we've just had Mike Phelan come back into the club with uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer as his assistant and Mike Phelan of course was Fergie's assistant. 
So to look at bringing in another previous Fergie assistant from the 90s, everyone's like, oh, it's just going to be a repeat of the problems. But as, as I've been sort of explaining on United People's TV, uh, Ten Hag's relationship with McLaren was not built on what he did at United. It was what he did at FC20. And at the same time, he's also got knowledge of United. So I don't think it's going to be Ron Van Persie. I think there's uh, quite, uh, problems with uh, his work visa. So I'm not sure whether he can actually leave yep. Feyenoord. Uh I probably think you're right. I think it will be Steve McLaren. And I'm not against it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, well, I suppose we'll find out further down the line. But one thing that all United fans are really excited about, and we don't really have... I mean, you can see his success there at Ajax, but Eric Ten Hag, because of that Ajax reinvention, as it, to go back to the title of your book here, The Glorious Reinvention and the Rebirth of Ajax Amsterdam, one of the fundamental parts of that that was brought in, not brought in, but reiterated, was the youth system. Uh, and obviously, in the last few years, the players that have come through is ridiculously insane. Ajax have always had such an incredible academy. Um, how, how has Eric Ten Hag used that system? Um, are there any uh, the examples, of course, you can run through is De Ligt and De Jong. But how important are the youth team players? And I suppose, what's his relationship like with them? Because I think the one thing that Ten Hag really has clearly done is he's coached these academy players into world-class players and not everybody can do that it's quite a hard thing to do uh, but what, what has it been like watching the youth uh, Ajax in the last few years because that's just some, this United youth team right now we're in our first FA Youth Cup final in 10 years we've got a great crop of youngsters we can get the right manager in hopefully in Eric Ten Hag to let them blossom we could have some wonderful players there what can United fans expect in terms of Ten Hag's relationship with the youth team well, this is one of the things I'm most excited about with Ten Hag going uh, to the club itself because he does have a very good relationship with younger players and and, and working with the youth team staff uh, at Ajax. And I'm, I'm sure, 100% sure, he can carry that forward to United because United itself, they may not be doing a lot of things right at the moment, but the academy is being run quite well and they have some of the best players anywhere in the world uh, in terms of academy talent coming through. Um, so that's that's a very big positive and, and something to work on. I think that that should be the centerpiece of the next era of United that they should focus on, regardless of uh, how they perform in the league. These, these players should be honed into the squad. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's easier to say than to do it, I imagine, but um, it's something that should be focused on. But in terms of Ajax itself, once again, it's a, a combination of several people working together and several people having the same goal. Uh, in, in Ajax's case, uh, Ronald De Boer is one of the more important figures uh, the former Ajax defender, the brother Frank. Uh, he's uh, one of the people in charge of overseeing the academy and overseeing the work that happens there. He doesn't have the biggest role, but he he sort of uh, provides individual training to certain players and then tries to make them better. And it's the same for several Ajax legends who come in and help out uh, these younger players for the benefit of Ajax. Uh, but more um, significantly is the work of John Heitinger, uh, the former Everton defender, who is now the head coach of the second team of the second um, Ajax squad. Uh, he's just, he's been quite an influential figure because he's in constant conversation with the Ajax senior team and trying to suggest what players uh, would be better and what players what, what players need uh, in the future. So I think it's, it's, it's once again, a combination of several people working together with Ten Hag itself and Ten Hag has taken full advantage of it. Uh, as you mentioned, the names there, uh, Delict, uh, Donny van der Beek even, Several names have come in and become great players and they've been sold on to the future. And it's, it's going to happen in the long term as well, where several Ajax players still become future stars for different clubs around Europe because that is now the Ajax way. They don't just want to make players who are good enough for the ADVC. They want to make players who are good enough for a Champions League level or Europa League level at least to sort of compete with the European be the, the best teams in Europe. Um, so it's a, it's a big positive that Ten Hag's coming to United and, and United have a good setup already because I'm excited to see how players like Mejbri and... Uh, Zidane Iqbal perform and even the youth the youth cup final this week uh, or next week it's a pretty big deal that 50,000 people have signed up to go for the game or hopefully go for the game and it's, it's a big event for United itself it should be very well celebrated no, it's incredible it's the first final since 2011 and that team in 2011 had Jesse Lingard in Paul Popper uh, Ravel Morrison Michael yeah. Keane it's had a lot of players who've come through and established themselves as as well in the case of Popper one of the best in the world yeah, well, not United, uh, and uh, in other players, just like actual senior professionals. So it's, we've got the likes of Charlie McNeil, wonderful striker, we've got Alejandro Garnacho. Uh, we've got, uh, I can't remember, never remember his name, never remember his name, he's a Norwegian kid. It seems like uh, Norson, I'm not going to ruin his name. But anyway, there's a really good crop of youngsters. I'm excited to see it. But one thing about youngsters, right, it's, it's not just all about the youth, it's about the balance. And I think the balance that he's got right at Ajax has been 
the likes of Tadic and Halle coming into the club. Um, what, what, what sort of insight can you give us into that uh, in terms of what sort of roles do those experienced players play on the pitch? You know, how, what are they like in their press conferences? What are they like for Ten Hag? Because it has to be the balance between good youth players, exciting talents, but also established senior players and getting that correct and getting that balance right is what made that team in 2018-19 and what has effectively made this Ajax team so exciting the last few years, right? Yeah, I mean, if you talk about that, you go back 10, 15 years because it, the whole system of younger players being mixed with experienced players came as a result of um, a changed transfer policy and a changed wage structure. Now, Ajax traditionally had a wage ceiling where they couldn't pay a player a certain amount, but they broke that ceiling uh, in 2018 with the signings of Talich and Daly Blint from United, of course, uh, and they wanted to have this mix of experience and younger players. Uh, and and Ultimately, as, as you've seen, it worked out quite well. Tadic has arguably been their best player for the last four years, or most consistent player for the last four years, and Daily pin has been a mainstay in the team. And Sebastian Holle eventually became uh, their record signing, and he's backed that up with a lot of gold. Uh, so traditionally, their whole structure was to mainly focus on younger players and, and promote from the academy. But Ajax felt in order to compete with the European or the best clubs in Europe, they needed to sign players from abroad and only sign players that they couldn't find in the academy. So Tadic, who's been playing as either, either a winger or as a forward, uh, they didn't have enough of good ones in the academy, so they felt the signing needed to be made. Uh, and same for Haller. Uh, and, you know, apart from that, th these players have bought a significant level of experience and leadership to the team. Uh, Tadic is the captain of the squad now. He has been the captain for the last three years. Uh, and he's been one of the most important figures purely because he he motivates players to play for Ajax. He, he has a genuine desire to play for Ajax. He wants to succeed at Ajax. Uh, and he's backed it up for the last four years. Uh, even in, when he first joined, he convinced Hakim Ziyech to stay at the club uh, for a further season. And they formed a very good relationship together. And they, obviously, that, that was the same season in the Champions League semi-final. Uh, so he's been quite an important figure. Daily Blind, as we all know, he's a quiet leader on his own. In when at United, I don't think he was a big problem. He was a talented individual, a very intelligent yeah. player. So he's backed it up again at Ajax. So uh, they don't mind spending big money or relatively big money uh, to to bring in an experienced player because it sort of helps mould uh, the younger players that are coming through. So it's it's a good mix that they've had for the last few years. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely worked. And, and one player, of course, uh, that a lot of United fans are still... Uh, it's frustrating. It's Donny van der Beek. It, it, because we, when he when he signed, he was he was in the Ballon d'Or top twenty. He was like such a significant and important player for Eric Ten Hag. But at Manchester United, he's just been a ghost of himself. We've misused him a lot of the time. Haven't really given him that much opportunity in the Premier League. But I'll be completely honest. Uh, in other games, I don't think he's done completely enough. He, he hasn't been that level of player that, that there was at Ajax. But a lot of United fans are hoping Ten Hag's going to come back in. All of a sudden, Van der Beek will get back to his best. Is that something you? can see happening or do you think because we've got Bruno Fernandes that, that Van der Beek will have to really really fight for his for his way back in the team but it's complicated because you know the easiest thing to say would be that Ten Hag's here and Van der Beek will suddenly become a great player once again but I don't think it's that simple because uh, the squad itself is not uh, properly equipped for Van der Beek to succeed uh, I do think it was a signing made without Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's permission or uh, they may have just seen the opportunity and taken it because 40 million yeah. is a fairly small figure for for Man United. Um, so I think that was the case in the end, and it was just a player that was sort of dumped onto the squad that they didn't necessarily need, and, and the player himself could have made a better move. Uh, but now that Ten Hag's here, he must feel positive about it. Uh, and to put, to put a bit of context into it, Ten Hag and Van der Beek didn't exactly have the best start at Ajax. Um, it was quite similar to, to now, where Van der Beek wasn't playing very often, where he was dropped to the bench. There was even a, a rumour around the Netherlands where people felt Van der Beek was leaking stories to the media about Eric Ten Hag, uh, but that was ruled out by the club. Um, so mm -hmm. that wasn't there. But eventually, in the 2018-19 season, Van der Beek eventually found more opportunities in the squad because uh, Ten Hag finally found his rhythm in Ajax, where he finally found the group that could play in midfield, which was uh, Frankie de Jong, Lassie Schoen and Van der Beek uh, in midfield. But it took a while to find that because Ajax were having either injury problems or they didn't have the right personnel. But eventually took Van, uh, Van der Beek about halfway through that season to find his form and and find his place in the team. And since then, he's been undroppable. For, or he was undroppable for Ajax. He was part of the Champions League team and he scored in the semi-final uh, and the quarter-final as well. 
uh, and he was part of the teams that came after, which was uh, when they won the league uh, in twenty. I didn't win the league. They won. They were. Well, they were about to win the league at least. So he was. He was quite an important figure in that in that portion. Um, but I think that at United, he will need some time uh, to find. Uh, Van der Beek will need some time to find his place in the team purely because, as you mentioned, Bruno Fernandes is there. I imagine he'd be the first choice, and the people behind him. It, I can't imagine Van der Beek, McTominay, and Fred being a very good Van de, uh, being a very good midfield no. uh, because it's it's very unprotected, very insecure, very unsecure for for Van der Beek to succeed. So he needs a few players around him to succeed, and he will take some time to find his place in the team. Uh, fingers crossed he comes good. If he doesn't come good, then you know it would just be one of those. I completely agree with you, by the way. Uh, it definitely was an opportunistic signing rather than a, an actual signing made by Solskjaer. I've, I've said that since day one. I've, I've seen nothing to prove otherwise. But I think uh, to, to, to ask you a final question, what do you think the United fans should really expect in the first three months under Eric Ten Hag? You know, what will be what will be first on his like? to-do list what will be the first things that he makes sure that he establishes at the club because it's, it's a very hard task he's walking into and all United fans are just doing this and just hoping that he can nail it that man right there but what do you think we should expect in the first three months of Eric Ten Hag at United well it'd be difficult uh, that's quite easy to say I think it'd be quite diff- it won't be as smooth as people assume um, I think that it will as I always as I always said this that it will be it will get worse for United before it gets better. And I, I imagine it'll get quite good for him in, in time by the end of the season. But there will be quite a few bad results. I can fully imagine first game of the season against Crystal Palace and lose at home. Um and it's, it's entirely possible. But there will be positivity at the end of it. I can I can say that. Um he is a good manager, a, a very tactically astute manager, but because of the as I mentioned, the mess left before him, there's a lot of cleaning up to do before he can implement his own ideas. Uh, and a lot of it will be determined by stuff out of his control. So that's the transfers, how much support he gets, even if he gets his own stuff, if he gets the stuff he wants. Um, so it will be quite complicated at the start. But I imagine by around Christmas-ish, which is a good time to say that he will finally start being able to show what he's made of. Uh, I, I think it's important, and it's quite difficult to say, but it's, it's important to keep expectations relatively low until Christmas. But if there uh, there will be a gradual improvement towards the end of next season, rather than an immediate start, that's that's my prediction. Anyways, uh, I could be completely wrong here, um, but going to win all straight away. No, no. Exactly, my prediction is that they, they could completely win the first five games of the season, be top of the league with a very strong goal difference or whatever. But it, it will it will be quite difficult to to or it'll be a complicated start, and you know a lot of it will be will be determined by, determined by which um, competition they're playing in as well. They could be playing Conference League, could be playing Europa League. Who knows? So it'll be quite interesting to see, but I imagine that it will be a mixed start. Some positives, mostly positives, but some really strong negatives as well. Uh, I think uh, I, I know, I know United fan is under any illusion that next year we're winning at all. But all we want, all I don't speak for every United fan, but me myself, next season is not about the silverware that comes. It's about the identity of United in August compared to the identity of United in May. If I can confidently say that is a new United team and just week by week there's incremental improvements because one thing that United have done is just chopped and changed formations and players and this and out that this will be Eric Ten Hag's way and it's either you're on board or you're off you're, you're going to get booted off and that's something I'm looking forward to really really looking forward to but I would say thank you very much Karen for your time today I'll put it up on screen again now and I'll leave I'll leave a link in the description as well this is the glorious reinvention rebirth of Amsterdam Ajax Amsterdam only 12.79 on Amazon go over there and buy it and go oh dear that's the wrong button there we go you off the screen but thank you very much for your time today Karen. i really really appreciate it man no worries thank you for having me on uh but look and there uh, hopefully we can have a maybe just have a conversation further in the season after we've started winning all the games right yeah definitely if that happens hopefully we'll <laughs> hey, look, if that, yeah, it might not it might not but thank you very much <laughs> and take it easy everyone have a good weekend eh? yeah you too yes, I'm-